Hello, I'm Kathleen Snyder and welcome to Backstage Antiques. I've been a collector of antiques for many years and operate my own antique shop, Arcade Antiques, located in Riverside, Illinois. I was delighted when the producer of the series asked me to host each program. And I'm looking forward to bringing an informative show each week. So after a lot of research and meetings, we've lined up some interesting and educational programs for you. Each half hour program will be centered on one area of antiques and we are even planning several shows with the studio audience. For our first show we are going to examine antique lamps. Tonight we've brought you several beautiful examples and I love antique lamps. I collect them myself. Joining me is Mr. Fred Crack, owner of Frederick's Antiques on West Belmont Avenue in Chicago. Fred is a lamp specialist, an appraiser, and a collector. Welcome to our program. Oh, thank you, Kay. I'm happy to be here and appreciate the opportunity to discuss antique lamps with you. As you know, lamps have been in our history back a couple hundred years. Uh, if we talk about the history of lamps, during the colonial times they had pine splint, candles, and grease lamps. Up until about 1850, the whale oil lamp came into existence and then we went into the kerosene and also the other oil lamps. 1879 brought the electric lamp to us. On uh, some of the lamps, uh, was gasoline part of, uh, when did gasoline lamps come into gasoline being? Gasoline was in existence from approximately 1850 until the electricity came in. It was it was coal gas. It was coal gas is what was used, not, and that was used along with the oil lamps. Those were considered more dangerous, though, weren't they? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, different oils were used with the oil lamps. Uh, whale oil, um, and they were scented so as to be not so offensive when you could smell the animal fat burning. Right. Um, and mostly after 1850, uh, I think kerosene was a prime. Uh, igniter for the lamps. Okay, uh, I think this is a very early example we've brought in tonight. Fred, do you think you can tell us something about that? Uh, yeah, this is a very early and beautiful lamp. Uh, the base is made out of wood and uh, this part is also wood which is beautifully hand painted with little brass fittings. Here we have a pressed glass bowl that holds the kerosene or oil all of these lamps had a glass shade such as this and uh, they have the little knob that turns the wick up and down. This was something that was added later on. I would think that lamp would date about 1860 to 1870. Yes, I would say that's, okay. that's about right. Now this is a beautiful example of, uh, I think it's art glass, wouldn't you say? I would almost? say you could call it art glass. It's an overlay glass uh, made of two different colors of glass. Uh, it was blown out and then put onto this base. Here we have a uh, milk glass base, again with brass or bronze type fittings. Probably uh, the same era, possibly uh, a little newer, maybe 20 years newer than this wooden base lamp. Yeah, this lamp uh, looks rather uh, late Victorian to me. Mm -hmm. And the other I think would be uh, mid to uh, early Georgian, mm -hmm. or late Georgian, excuse me. Uh, this is a cute little lamp. I think this was uh, used probably to go from room to room and like a little child would have this to uh, find their way probably. Yeah, they started putting the handles on a lot of the small lamps to make them safer. Um, and they're, they're very, very collectible because they're small and f easily fit into a cabinet. There are many different kinds. Yeah, those are hard to come by now. In yeah, the shop, sure. I just can't seem to find any of the they little sh ones. They sure are. The bigger ones. I think this is the piece de resistance, and I know yeah. you're going to enjoy talking about this one. Yeah, that's one of the more beautiful lamps. Uh, many of these lamps were called Gone with the Wind lamps, but uh, that was just a name that came along later. Uh, these were all banquet lamps originally. Uh, some of them had a shade up here, some of them didn't. This happens to be a fine porcelain uh, made by the uh, Meissen manufacturing in, in Germany, oh, well over a hundred years old. 
even the porcelain uh, font that holds the kerosene, uh, this probably didn't have a shade. It just had the chimney with a double wick. Some of them have a single, some have a double. And this is beautiful. I notice the uh, porcelain is all uh, hand applied. There's little cherubs down here for the faces and it's quite a tall lamp. I venture mm -hmm. to say it's about 30 inches tall with the hurricane on. Mm -hmm. And uh, imagine how how beautiful that must have looked. And they took it for granted and now they just don't make porcelains like this any longer. No, they sure don't. And this is really nice. Um, can you tell us anything else about uh, the early uh, wick lamps and uh, candle lamps or gasoline lamps? Well, some of them, which we don't have an example of here, had a shiny chrome type shield on the back to reflect the light. That was to give more light. Um, Those would have been hanging lamps as opposed to carrying? Usually or? on the wall, right. Mm -hmm. Although some of the miniature ones did have a stand and they also had that backing on them. Um, po possibly the people would like to know something about investing um, in these type of lamps. As an investment, I don't think that these lamps should be looked at from that angle. Uh, you should be interested in the beauty of these type of lamps. They can range in any price range. They can, they can go from the low, under $100, up into the thousands, depending on the quality and so on. And I think we should look more at the beauty rather than investing in these type, because we never know how strong the dollar is going to be or what's going to affect the investment character, characteristics. Well, I know you have some in your shop, and I do. I have some uh, uh, just very simple glass. They probably were from a farm and something. Uh, but these, as you said, this would be a collector's investment for the beauty of it, mm -hmm. rather as, as a lighting device, just mm -hmm. for the beauty of the porcelains and the glass and different things. Um, I'm looking forward to our next discussion, which will be going into the early uh, lighting devices from 1879 on, uh -huh. and uh, we've brought some very fine examples of lamps, some very cute little ones and some big ones, and I think we'll close this and we'll be right back after a brief message. Welcome back, collectors, and now we're into the portion of our program on electrical lamps. Fred, can you tell us when electrical lamps came into uh, the being? Well, as we said before, electrical lamps came into existence around 1879. However, the ones that are popular today, oh, most of those came into existence around the late Victorian period or the late 1800s and the very collectible ones are from the Art Nouveau period and the Art Deco period, which takes us again from the late, teen, late 1800s up until the 19, around 1940 or so. Oh, that's, uh, we have a couple of very nice examples that we brought tonight. Uh, would you like to uh, tell us about that sweet little, looks like a little lady's hat, little doll lamp. That's a little pear point. They call that a pear point puffy. Pearpoint Manufacturing, which was a manufacturer of silver plate goods long before they even made lamps, uh, made many of the Art Nouveau lamps. They come in many different sizes, many different shapes. That happens to be a little small boudoir lamp, which is one of the smallest ones, and probably one of the rarest ones because the shade is actually blown out. All of these shades on this type of lamp are blown hand blown and there will be no mold marks in these type in these type of lamps the bases are always signed the shade may or may not be signed that very it really is a cute little lamp but where do you see the one we have coming up now it's uh oh it's only about 10 inches tall and it looks like a an aladdin lamp uh, aladdin uh, genie type lamp but yeah. i'll let you explain it that is kind of a rare lamp. That's a Bradley and Hubbard, which was also made at the same time as Pearpoint. The shape of that is very unusual. The shade is uh, 
shows the Bradley and Hubbard made many shades like that. However, the base is a real cutie. Uh, these were also signed sometimes and not signed at others. This is a small one. They made many different sizes, uh, many different finishes. Uh, I don't think the quality was as good as Pearpoint was, though. And this is an American manufacturer, well, too? These are all American manufacturers. Uh, East Coast type? About. or uh, Pearpoint, I think, was in yes. uh, Massachusetts? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, this is a beautiful uh, lamp. That's a little Mo Bridges lamp. Uh, many of the shades are what we call reverse painted. They could have a scene on them. They could have flowers. Uh, they could have a geometric design depending on the lamp. Again, this is a small lamp. Mo Bridges was made in Wisconsin. Uh, the shade is signed along the rim on the very bottom. Uh, some of the bases are signed, some are not. This happens to be, again, a, a boudoir lamp. You would uh, estimate this to be between 1910 and about 1920? or it, Yeah, uh, I would say that, was, that would be the period of... Yeah, that's uh, very desirable. The shades in. are... Well, you just can't get shades like that anymore. They, nobody would take the time to do the reverse painting. They probably had young people painting. Right. Just children. Oh, here comes something that you're really going to like. This is your forte. It's just a beautiful, beautiful Tiffany lamp. Right. Everybody knows the word Tiffany, that's for sure. Uh, Tiffany, again, was the maker at the same time as these other manufacturers, but the best known maker. Tiffany lamps, uh, usually when we think of a Tiffany, though, we think of leaded lamps. They did make some fine glass lamps, such as this. The shade is on a swivel base. It has a gold patina on it. Uh, they made lamps exactly like this that were floor lamps. They made many, many different kinds of lamps. Uh, there are many books out on Tiffany lamps. This is one of the finest. It's a limited edition uh, by Dr. Egan Neustadt. And uh, this happens to be number 51. And a book like this, when it originally came out, cost $150. And it's probably worth $300 today. And that's just the book. That's very nice. Uh, I noticed in a lot of Tiffany's pieces that we have seen in other collections, they used a lot of fruit and uh, vegetables and flowers for their theme. Mm -hmm. I noticed on that last it was a melon base. Right. And uh, very, very nice. And it is signed Tiffany. Mm -hmm. uh, we brought a lot of small lamps tonight because they're easier to carry, but we brought really sweet little lamps. This is a little gumdrop that just came up now. Well, these are, many people call these their Tiffany lamps, which, because it was made at the same time as Tiffany. There are, this, this is what we just call a normal panel shade, uh, caramel glass. They did come in different colors, again, different sizes and different fancinesses. However, the value as opposed to the other lamps is not as high because there really isn't as much artwork in these type of lamps. There's no hand painting and this type of thing, but they are very desirable for decorating and so on. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, uh, okay, we're switching a little bit to a different type of a lamp. Uh, okay. This looks like it's from about 1925 to 1935. Mm -hmm. And I know you'll know who manufactured that. Well, that base, uh, the glass part, was made by Steuben. Uh, I think everybody knows the word Steuben, too. Uh, they've been a glass manufacturer for a oh, hundred years. They uh, they make all kinds. They still are in business. They make uh, mostly clear glass now, but they did make a lot of the art glass because some of the artisans and the workmen went from Tiffany to work for Steuben, and they made all the different types of glass that Tiffany did, and of probably of equal quality, it's just that the name is not quite as good as Tiffany. Here's a uh, late... Oh, that's that's really a yeah, beauty, isn't late it? Late deco, yeah, that is uh, marble and... Uh, Oh, it looks like brands, a painted brands, or coal painted, I think. Yeah. And well, as you can see, not all uh, lamps were, this wouldn't throw much light, and all lamps weren't made to, to throw a lot of light, but mostly for decoration, some of these Art Deco lamps. Uh, they always had those figures on there, and uh, alabaster or marble was very popular at that time. That is a real cutie. Yeah, that... Uh, 
there was usually that theme of the lovers was used in several different lamps. They used or in different uh, meetings. They had bookends and they had the single and the double, and then they grouped them together. And uh -huh. uh, those were were quite. Uh, I think the heyday was about 1928. Uh -huh. Oh, here comes. Uh, my very favorite <laughs> lamp, <laughs> my very favorite. I will have to tell you this, that I purchased this lamp from Fred about four years ago, and we'll give you a little history on restoration. Fred will verify that when we got this lamp, it was painted in enamel, and it was pink and black. There was no detailing whatsoever on it. It depicts an Arab uh, sitting in his tent being served by a slave girl. It seems like I'm telling everything about it, but oh, I love the lamp nice. so much that uh, it's, it's just a, a great lamp, and yeah. the restoration on that was uh, almost as much as what the lamp well, the, cost. Those Indian designs are very, very popular today, the Mideast designs uh, in paintings and lamps. Okay. Our last lamp of the electrical period is a um, Art Nouveau. Yeah, it's Art Nouveau. It's mm -hmm. a probably early Art Nouveau. It, it, uh, it probably belongs at the beginning of the discussion, but uh, again, it was a, dec a decorative lamp these were called uh, newel post lamps, or sometimes down at the bottom of the stairs, they were used. And most of the figures were made in France and a spelter yeah, they to call simulate it a bronze. They call it a French bronze, which mm -hmm. is, but it's spelter. Some of them were bronze, but the majority of them are white metal. Well, she sure takes the cake, and we'll be right back after a brief message. Welcome back again. This is the final portion of our show, and we're going to discuss the care and maintenance of lamps. Well, common sense is the first thing, but Fred, I'll have you spell it out for us. Right. Well, on any of these lamps, which are mostly hand-painted, you obviously wouldn't want to use anything that was very caustic. Um, a mild soap solution, and in most cases, the lamps will not get that dirty. The outside of the lamp may get smoke and that can be washed off because usually they're not painted on the outside. Uh, what I like to use is, uh, like on the base, I would use something like Pledge, which would polish it up and, and, and keep it clean. And on the shade, again, just be careful so you don't injure the painting. Um, in keeping with uh, the lamps, you wouldn't want to uh well, like in a fabric shade or something, rather than a frequent washing of them, is to get like a feather duster to attract the dust off of it. Right. Uh, we didn't bring any uh, f uh, fabric shades this evening because we like glass lamps and different medias because mm -hmm. they're just harder to come by. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, as lamps as an investment, uh, what would you think the hottest investment or the down the road investment would be right now for well right now uh, like art glass or yeah uh, right now I think again the Tiffany the PowerPoint uh, handel these type of lamps are again people are investing in them the prices have dropped off over the past few years and we have the whole new crop of investor coming in the younger generations are starting to buy but they're buying at the lower strata, the lower uh, priced lamps. When I say in a lower priced lamp in Tiffany, you're talking about three, four thousand uh, dollars. What was the most expensive Tiffany you ever saw in an auction, Fred? Well, recently a world record was set for over five hundred thousand dollars for a Magnolia Tiffany lamp. It was a very rare, one-of-a-kind lamp, evidently. Uh, prior to that, it had been up to like three hundred thousand oh, dollars. Hard right. to believe for one lamp. Huh? One lamp. I'd hate to carry it down the runway at a, <laughs> at a show or anything like that. Uh, do you think that uh, there will always be uh, availability of lamps, or do you think they're being snatched up by collectors to uh, and being hidden? Every now and then I get a collector that comes into the store that wants to upgrade their lamps. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, I think they'll always be around. They'll be traded like coins, just the, the same type of fashion. Uh, it's supply and demand. Where do the uh, people, do they display them in their homes or do they, uh, you know, do they have like special areas for them, do you think? Like I, I display mine 
I have a very small living room, and mm -hmm. I have 15 lamps in my living room. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I just enjoy lamps I very much. I think an much. avid collector would be in the same position. They're, the more just, they have, they're going to display them. Some people are happy with one or two lamps, you know, and, uh, or one of an example of each type, which isn't a bad way to go. I'd like to have that magnolia lamp. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be great. Uh, has, uh, do you know anything about the wiring of lamps, any safeguards that we should uh, look for? Or? Well, obviously, all these old, any old lamp should be rewired if you intend to use it. Uh, because the wire becomes old in the base and eventually shorts out. So it should be done by someone who knows what they're doing, electrician. Uh, and then you can even put a rheostat on, on a lot of the lamps to get just the right light uh, on some of the more expensive lamps because the light is important. Uh, and keep nothing over a 40-watt bulb in, in these That's types of lamps. That's what I would say. I use a lot of 15 and 25-watt bulbs mm -hmm. because you just want to have the beauty. You don't want a glaring right. light. Yes, and so often, uh, if the bulb is too hot, it can uh, burn out the element and uh, crack a shade, too. Right. So you ha really have to be careful. And you have to have a lot of ventilation uh, with uh, lamps. I mean, like if you put it on a carpeted surface or in something heavy, mm -hmm. make sure that there's a, a lot of air going around. Mm -hmm. um, do you collect any particular type of a lamp yourself? Or? Well, I like the Art Nouveau, Art Deco lamps, uh, mostly Art Nouveau. Uh, I started years ago with the Handel and PearPoint and oh, when yeah. the prices were low though, a couple hundred dollars and you could buy all you want, but those prices have uh, gone five and ten times over that in the last ten years. Oh boy. Uh, Handel is, uh, they made a considerable amount of floor lamps too, didn't they? Or Did they all do a lot of floor lamps, the different? Uh I noticed we just brought tabletops. Yeah, uh, today. mostly but Tiffany stuck to the floor lamps. There, mm -hmm. Handel made a few uh, floor lamps uh, of, of one or two de designs, but not too many. Basically, Handel worked in bronze, or they, they did all their bases in bronze, and uh, some of their shade was in, w shade work was in bronze with the uh, hand painted scenes, or again the bent glass, which even with that name on it makes it uh, fairly valuable. Uh, in the 20s in Chicago, there was the Monarch Lamp Company, and uh, they were up on the north side, and I have a few examples of their lamps. Mm -hmm. They did a lot with alabaster and marble and doré brands, just beautiful pieces. Do you think those will ever reach the activity that an art glass lamp would uh, achieve? Most of them had silk shades and very... Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, I don't think so because I think most of those are decorator items uh, and maybe collectible because of a Chicago name. But mm -hmm. uh, Tiffany, that name, being the artist and he was, uh, I think that's why those are so collectible. And there is, you know, there's a limited quantity of those. They were even expensive when you, when they first came out. You know, to spend three or four hundred dollars on a lamp in the early 1900s was a lot of money. It would be equivalent to several thousand. Mostly now. wealthy families had them at that time. Uh, are all of Tiffany's pieces signed, and or if they're not, how are they generally signed? I would say that I don't know what percent, but maybe 95 percent are signed. Right? Uh, they're signed with a little tag in in the shade, and uh, the bases are uh, all bases are signed from what I have seen. And they say uh, LC. T or uh, Lewis, Comfort, Lewis Tiffany, Comfort Tiffany or Tiffany Studios. Tiffany Studios, New York. New York. Right. Mm -hmm. And Tiffany did an awful lot of work with bronzes and uh, used nothing some, but quality. He did quality. some beautiful bronze along with his glass, right? Yeah, just beautiful quality. He made desk sets in bronze and uh, ink wells and. Yeah, people just a lot of time think of his windows or something yeah. like that. We were fortunate that we had the uh, Tiffany exhibition here two years ago. That's right. Boy, and it, it stayed longer than it should have, and it was something that we all enjoyed seeing. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, the wisteria lamps, everything he had done. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this just about wraps it up, Fred. I want to thank you very much for uh, being here this evening. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us on Backstage Antiques. And I want to uh, ask you to come back next week when we will be discussing the art of early American glass with Ken Kilner of Karen D. Antiques of Oak Park.